Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome back to Your Finance TV. As you know, is the regular thing on a Friday. We have Jay Pulaski here from uh, TPW Advisory. How are you, Jay? Hey, Scott. Nice to see you. How are you, buddy? I'm great, mate. I'm great. <laughs> battling through, battling through. All right. The title of your musings this week is Stability, $1 trillion reward, or Wanted Stability, $1 trillion reward. Where can I get some of that reward money, Jay? <laughs> well, kind of what, what flashed into my mind was the old wanted posters, you know, with uh, the picture and then the... Uh, sum of money underneath and and it really kind of came together uh for me this morning when i was going through some of my notes for the course of the week to get ready to write the musings and a couple of numbers jumped out at me right so the first was the vix the vix broke under 13 it's the lowest level for the vix which is the kind of the traditional uh way of measuring equity risk uh the lowest level in three and a half years so the entire COVID period, right? Uh, the second was the move index, which measures volatility in the US treasury market. That that hit 97 this morning. And that's the lowest for that risk indicator or volatility indicator since uh, February of 2022, when the Fed was really starting to get cranking on its rate hiking uh, cycle. So volatility uh, as measured by the financial markets is very muted. And it reminded me that when we published our 2023 outlook a little more than a year ago, so late October, early November of 2022, the title was Stability Ahead and with a question mark. <laughs> so we weren't quite definitive, right? We were raising the issue. And now as we get ready to go into Q4, as we get ready to go into 2024, Stability seems to be manifesting. And the last number that really uh, kind of led to this whole title in this, in this week's musing was from Bank of America and their flow report this morning, which uh, identified $1 trillion has gone into U.S. money market funds year to date en route, they think, to a $1.4 trillion for uh, the entire year, which would be a record. So it's kind of like that old wanted poster, right? What do we want? We want stability. What's the reward? One trillion dollars that's going to come out of that money market fund, those money market funds, and go into risk assets once everyone's comfortable that uh, stability has returned. And my point would be that the VIX, the move index, and a number of other things we can talk about uh, in a few minutes are starting to suggest we're transitioning into a period of stability. Yeah, you talk, when you talk about that in your in your musings, and um, people can sign up, obviously, at TPW Advisory. Sorry, at Pulaski.com, I should say. You, you're talking about these four areas of traction, uh, and you're talking about that transition from uncertainties to stability. Can you go into those four areas first, or at least kick us off with a couple of them, at least? Yeah, exactly, because... That's the meat of the musings. And it's something, again, we've been talking about for quite some time. We wrote about transition time now three months ago. We wrote a, a musings called Traction. We simply titled it Traction, I think now three weeks ago. So as usual with, uh, you know, with how we work at TPW Advisory, it's an iter iterative process, right? We gradually move down the road towards greater understanding of how things are working. And so uh, in this instance, we have four areas of focus uh, where we want to see uh, during this time of transition, right, transitioning to stability, transitioning away from monetary policy in the Fed to fiscal policy, transitioning uh, from deflation fears to inflation in Japan, transitioning from COVID to consumption in China. So those are the multiple transitions we're looking for globally, right? And then we want to see where what gains traction, right? Because in times of transition, what gains traction is going to determine where we go, okay? So the four area, two of the four, and we'll break it down. I think it's a good idea. Break it down into two and two. So the first two are uh, the disinflationary trend that we see um, occurring in both the U.S. and Europe. And then secondly, uh, the manufacturing recovery we expect to see 
uh, globally. So let's touch on the first one. We think the Fed is approaching the finish line uh, in its rate hiking uh, cycle. We think the ECB is roughly in a similar spot. So they're kind of caught up to the Fed after lagging uh, the Fed, right? And the Fed, let's remember, lagged the emerging market central banks. Those central banks were the first ones to raise rates in this rate global rate tightening cycle. And by the way, they're now leading the rate cutting cycle, which is what we think is coming down the road. Just in the last couple of weeks, Chile, Brazil, Peru, Poland have all started to cut rates. So while we're in the US and, and in Europe kind of you know, glued to our Fed and ECB watching, the reality is that the world is already moving to a rate cutting cycle. So, and that obviously is dependent on a continuation of this disinflationary cycle, which we expect to see continue. And we just, as an example of where the market is, we just note the very kind of, you know, sh shoulder shrug reaction to uh, the US CPI and the ECB rate hike of the last couple of days. Really, very little impact on cross asset pricing, suggesting that much of this is now, you know, kind of fully in the price. And so we're looking at two things to make to, to, to ensure this continues on the disinflation side. The first is that shelter inflation or rents are going to cap and kind of sustain the disinflationary trend in the United States. That's key. And then secondly, in Europe, we anticipate several months, these next couple of months, being very supportive on a year-over-year -year basis, much as was the case back in, in May and June, remember, when we had big drops in the year-over-year, -year, we were replacing like a 1.2% CPI number with a 0.4% CPI number. So the year-over-year -year numbers really came in hard. Uh, Europe is right on the cusp of that these next couple of months. So that's that's the disinflationary trend. That's the shift from monetary policy to a focus on fiscal policy, new industrial policy in the U.S., Bidenomics, et cetera. That's a key, right? And so we're watching that carefully. We've seen a lot of data that suggests to us that that's starting to really manifest. And we're switching from watching the Fed and the ECB to watching the emerging market central banks, which are leading the rate cutting cycle. The second uh, uh, area of focus or signpost is uh, the manufacturing uh, side of things, where we expect to see a strong and stable consumer, full employment, record low unemployment pretty much in both the US and Europe, record high net worth in the United States, and not just because of stocks, but also rising house prices, and rising real incomes, all of which suggests that we're going to see a continued strong consumer, much as we saw with retail sales today in the United States. That leads to an inventory drawdown, right? And that is going to lead to an inventory restocking as production picks up in the months ahead. And that will take the manufacturing PMIs from under 50 to, which is is the, the mark of kind of expansion, right? 50 and above expanding, 50 below 50 contracting. Um, both the US and Europe uh, and China are below 50. And we expect in the next several months that China and the US are going to break above 50. And we would note that um, history suggests that the best, one of the best times to buy stocks is when the ISM PMI for manufacturing is below 50, but rising. And we expect that to be the case in the next couple of months. And this is gonna be also supported by that rising CapEx of what we've called the global CapEx boom, which we think is also slowly starting to unfold. And we'll give you two data points to support that. One is the, the declining amount of buybacks that is taking place in the United States, right? The last couple of years, companies have made, uh, have had lots of money, but they didn't want to invest because with COVID, et cetera, it's very unclear, right? So no one's making big investment plans. Well, that's now changing. Buybacks are, are falling off a cliff. CapEx is rising. JP Morgan reported 
that at the end of Q2, over 60% of US, uh, 60% of the S&P 500 companies rather, uh, were, re- were spending more on CapEx, increasing their CapEx spending. So strong and stable consumer, rising uh, CapEx, together equal manufacturing rebound. We wanna see that gain traction because that's going to give us confidence that the global economic recovery is going to be sustainable. Okay, so listen, a lot to take in just on those two points. But the other two points you're, you're looking at are earnings in China. And, and you're still a solo man out there running with your hand around going, I still like China. <laughs> um, but now on the earnings front as well, because we've just wrapped up earnings season pretty well much. I think we had Adobe report, not think, I know Adobe reported last night and Lenar on the home builders as well. So what do you what are you seeing on both of those sides? Well, I think the real key is not really like what happened in Q2 earnings, because that's a long time ago. We're almost ready to start Q3 here in, in like two to three weeks. But um, much more importantly is what are earnings revisions doing? So what are analysts doing with the information they took, not only from Q2, but companies giving forward guidance, right? How does the end of the year look? What's your first look into 2024? That's the tone, as you and I both know, uh, when the market, when people come back from summer, the, the, the shift almost always and automatically goes to the next year, right? And so that's where, that's what we want to focus on. That's one of the benefits of having 30 plus years of experience in this business is we want to focus forward, particularly coming out of the summer. And so earnings revisions for Q3 have been marked up over the last couple of months. That's the first time in several years that we've seen the, the the existing current quarter earnings revisions being marked up. So Q3 should be the first quarter of this year to have year over year earnings gains. More importantly, uh, earnings uh, uh, revisions and estimates for 2024 are being marked up. And FactSet reports that U.S. earnings are now forecast to be roughly uh, 11 or 12 percent up year over year next year. And that's important because the, the the bulk of the gain this year in the S&P has been multiple expansion, right? Because earnings, as we just touched on, have actually uh, been down year over year through the first half of the year. So earnings revisions, important to see that uh, continue. We want to highlight that not only are earnings revisions moving up in the U.S., but globally. So uh, pretty much with the exception of Europe, uh, uh, earnings revisions are turning up, and therefore uh, that's something that sustains the rest of the world uh, equity market as well. And the rest of the world also has, importantly, significant valuation support, where Europe and China are both trading at 20-year lows on a relative basis valuation-wise uh, to the United States. And so also I'll just add here before we switch to China, One other thing we don't expect to gain traction is the U.S. dollar. So importantly here, over the last eight weeks, the dollar's been up eight weeks in a row. So it's had a bit of a rally, been a surprise to us. And the question is, does it sustain? Does it gain traction? And our answer is no, in large part because of that disinflationary trend taking the Fed uh, off, uh, off of the rate hiking cycle. And therefore, the dollar should kind of subsume and weaken, and that should help corporate earnings next year as those offshore earnings get translated, you know, into uh, a weaker dollar. So that's the earnings outlook. And then um, last, but certainly not least, is uh, China. And obviously, there's been a ton of angst. Uh, We are one of the very few people that uh, are are admittedly and openly uh, constructive on Chinese equity. I would note that um, folks over at Alpine Macro just pointed out this week that on a relative basis, Chinese equity has stopped going down versus the broad EM or DM indices. And that's an important point, right? Before you can start to really perform, you have to stop underperforming. And so that's arguably, at least in Alpine Macro's uh, case, and they're a pretty well-respected macro shop, Uh, That's their point of view. Um, Our view is that uh, the data in China is getting better, notwithstanding the the bashing in the press. We'll give you two examples. 
Uh, most recently, the August trade data came out. Uh, they're down year over year. So exports were down, imports were down year over year. And boom, right away, you know, media glommed onto that and said, oh, yes, just yet another example of an imploding Chinese economy. As opposed to the reality, which was both numbers were better than expected, better than mm-hmm. forecast, and both numbers were better than expected and better than forecast for the second month in a row. Therefore, a little bit of a trend starting to, ma- uh, starting to manifest itself. We just had uh, Chinese retail sales and industrial production report overnight, better than expected, up month over month, okay? And the last is the uh, August PMI for manufacturing at under 50 at 49.7, better than the U.S. by significant margin. U.S. is around 47.5 or 48. So 49.7, up month over month, up to the third month in a row. And therefore, you know, you can start to to see. So the big question has been and remains, when do the drips and drabs of Chinese policy stimulus, of which there have been multitudes over the last couple of months, right? When do they kind of coalesce and gain traction and kick the economy up into another gear? We think that's already starting to manifest with the data that just was reported today. And would expect more of that in the coming months. And so we feel pretty good, actually, about uh, our Chinese equity overweight, given that it stopped underperforming versus the rest of the world, given this trend of nascent data over the last couple of months, and given the policy stimulus, which has been, again, kind of small and targeted to consumption and property, and not the big bazooka that everyone seems to be waiting for. We have no expectation that that's going to take place. That's not the way they want to move uh, in this regard. They want to be more targeted. Um, And so we expect that targeted stimulus to to take effect in the coming months. Okay, so taking all that in, uh, is there any big changes that have been happening to your model portfolio? Like (laughs) you've been pretty consistent with this theme the whole way through. Like there can't be that big of changes, could there? Well, we do like to be consistent um, and we do tend to try and think forward, uh, you know, very much uh, focused on six, 12, 24 months down the road with our models. And so uh, there was not, uh, there were not big changes. Remember, we have our two models that we offer our clients. One is our global multi-asset and the other is our TPW20, which is a thematic model portfolio. The thing that really jumped out uh, to me in looking at uh, the performance over the latest period was that the bulk of our leaders over the last month or so, particularly in the GMA, were commodity uh, exposure, right? And remember, we have been adding to commodities, right? That's one of the places when we say, where is that trillion dollar reward money going to go? We think it's going to go to commodities because we think we are going to have a manufacturing pickup. We are going to have a global economic recovery and people are very underweight, dramatically underweight commodities versus the other assets. So that's where we've been putting money. And thankfully, that's where uh, the performance has been. I'll just give you a quick uh, cross asset recap. Over the last three months, GSG, which is our our commodity uh, index proxy, uh, Goldman Sachs Commodity Index, is up 18 percent in the last three months, right? Acqui, global equities, up one. Barclays Ag, fixed income, down three. So it's been the place to be. Uh, We continue to be overweight commodities uh, in the global multi-asset model, but actually did take a little profit uh, in one of our positions there in the commodity space uh, and switch it into uh, robotics because we think that manufacturing rebound is going to manifest in more orders for automation, robotics, AI, all that type of stuff. So that that was the kind of the switch with very, very small um, and, and not really dramatic and significant. We remain overweight equities. We remain underweight fixed income, particularly sovereign bonds, though fair, it's fair to say we think that at these levels, um, there's not a whole lot of uh, downside to uh, the fixed income, what's called the treasury market in the long duration. 
nor do we, though, see a lot of upside because we're not of the view that the Fed is going to cut rates uh, dramatically. So our big bet basically is uh, has been over the last three or four months and remains uh, adding to commodities and uh, to emerging markets where we think the rate cutting cycle is going to jumpstart a um, economic recovery and a uh, equity market recovery for emerging markets. So both commodities and emerging markets are very low relative to the performance of developed market equities or U.S. equities over the last, you know, pick your time period, five, one year, five year, 10 years, et cetera. So that's where we think the opportunity is going to be as that stability that we've been looking for starts to manifest that trillion dollars in reward money that's sitting in money market funds starts to get more risk, uh, develop more of a risk appetite. We think that where that money is going to flow is in places like emerging market equity and debt, as well as the commodity space. What a great way to wrap up the show, Jay. Um, you must have some great plans this weekend as you're having your musings the first fall weekend. Maybe there's maybe you're going to be watching a bit of the Rugby World Cup. Is that your, your top priority sport-wise? That's your top priority sport-wise, my friend. Uh, befitting as an Australian such as yourself. Uh, but, but, but my uh, focus is American football. And uh, my Duke Blue Devils uh, will take the field tomorrow against Northwestern, uh, and we're hoping to go 3-0 and and maybe even crack the top 20 in the country in football, not basketball, football. So, again, it's a new age, it's a new dawn, and Duke football is on the upswing. So, yes, we'll be sitting in front of the TV uh, taking in that ball game. Well, good luck for the game, Jay, and we'll be talking to you again next week. Absolutely, my friend. Take care. Thank you. And for everyone else out there, good luck investing.